Welcome to Monday Morning Express. As we've told you, we've been busy this summer, not only with the show, but we had the Big Boy Project, and we've still been working on our Brass Expo. You can see our museum has paint, and we have all these plaques on the wall that's gonna make up our Hall of Fame for the brass model train industry. You're gonna have a blast looking at those. We can't wait to see you at the Brass Expo show. And as far as today's show, you're gonna love it. Welcome to Monday Morning Express. We wanted to start out the show by acknowledging uh, what everybody in that Houston area is going through. I didn't realize Houston was the fourth largest city in the US. So we, we both have some personal friends in that area. We know there's a lot of model railroading that goes on down there. If you happen to be viewing the show, uh, we know it's not the most important thing to you right now, but maybe it gives you a little break from uh, having to deal with all the heartache uh, that you're in the middle of. So we, we just want to acknowledge what some of our friends are dealing with. Yeah, Dan, you know, a couple of our customers have already emailed us uh, from Houston area. They appreciated watching the show. Give them a little break if they can, uh, be able to take care of that. Others who have family members there, so we're certainly thinking of them. But uh, also on today's show, we just wanted to uh, make mention that we're going to be talking with Mr. Boyd Reyes, and he is the first in our How To series. We're going to have 15 different segments with Boyd. Uh, we're going to talk about painting models and everything that goes into those. So we're looking forward to that on the show. Yeah, and that's something you're going to be able to go back and watch again and again because there's so much to glean from uh, some of that great information Boyd shared. Uh, we're going to go behind the scenes and reminisce about a uh, little known fact uh, that probably many are not aware of, of the early days of our company. Yeah, looking forward to that. And then, of course, uh, as you see on the screen behind us, we're going to be uh, talking with Mr. Reed Dennis uh, on our trip out in California. Uh, some of these gold plates. Can't wait to show you them on the show. Thanks for having us to your house again, Reed. We sure appreciate your hospitality. It's nice to have you here. Uh, many of our viewers will remember from our volume two of our price and data guide that uh, fascinating interview where we showed some of the gold plated and early hand belts. And uh, I know I appreciated learning from you, and I, I think many of them, we got a lot of great feedback. So it's really nice to be back here again with you and be able to talk about it a little bit. Well, it's, it's um, fun, really, that uh, my uh, period of, of being interested in these models and collecting sort of uh, went hand in glove or step by step with, uh, uh, with the way uh, the model train business built up from Japan right after World War II. And it started by the GIs really would take a photograph of a, of a locomotive and, and show it to a model builder over there and see if they could, uh, would build one like it. And, and uh, the general reaction was, no, we wouldn't build one, but we'll build you five or six. You know, and, it, and it, at, that, at that, the prices they were charging then they were so low and uh, the fellow said, oh, well, I'll sell them to other people on the ship or other people at the back of the barracks. And so he'd, he'd buy the five or six, and, and that's, the way the, that's the way the business really got started and was with the GIs. And they were, they were pretty rough, uh, some of those models, as, as indeed we have uh, some, one of them here that just has no detail on it, you know, no, no, no generators, no... Uh, uh, valves and, and things like that, uh, and it was uh, really uh, uh, Bill Ryan in Seattle who, who started a company called Pacific Fast Mail. He was an automobile dealer, and uh, but uh, he did this as a hobby, and he he is the one who came down to California and found people that could cast the the generators and the valves and things like that, and then he took them to to Japan and showed the Japanese how that to install them. So he really was the one who was responsible for the really detailed engines after World War II. And it's kind of neat because you've been fortunate enough to amass such a collection that you can kind of see that progress as you go through the years and the different models, can't you? Yeah, well, that's true. And, and, and an awful lot of this uh, came from the Bill Ryan collection itself. 
uh, he'd, uh, uh, was, it was going to be uh, sold off piece by piece, and uh, uh, somebody from uh, Michigan came in and, and uh, bought the whole thing, and I think it was, I don't know what he was, a doctor or a lawyer or an Indian chief, but, uh, uh, but he was somebody who didn't know a damn thing about models, but he thought he would make a great investment. And after about 10 years, he got tired of it. And I don't think he ever took them out of the boxes. And, uh, and it showed up again. And uh, that time I had a chance to buy the whole thing. Yeah, that's quite an opportunity. Yeah, oh, it was, yeah. That must have been fun because you unboxed them and really appreciated what you well, were looking at. Well, and uh, uh, all in all, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Japanese were so, uh, really so eager to, to help us out at that stage of the game. And we were helping them out, too. Yeah, speaking of, we were talking a little bit about some of the gold-plateds which mm -hmm. you have the whole collection of. There's nine HO, is that correct? There are nine in HO and one in HO and three. Right. And, uh, and I've got a, a whole nine of the HOs and uh, the one HO and three also. And kind of what's the backstory to those? What, why were they gold-plated? Well, the, the, uh, the manufacturers, uh, these little shops and uh, little uh, uh, places in Japan were so delighted to get an order to build five or eight or 10 or 12, no, not more than 12, but uh, uh, relatively small numbers that they, they made an extra one and gold plated it and then presented it to, to Bill Ryan as a gift. And uh, he kept them. And he kept them. He never sold them, which no, is amazing. Oh, no, 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 he kept them. And uh, so they were in his collection. And, uh, but they were a gift to, uh, to Bill Ryan, just saying thank you very much for the order for uh, building these other models. That was quite a thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, today, not only, like I think you mentioned, gold is much more expensive. Oh, yes. But even the process of gold plating a brass engine, we were told, is virtually impossible because what they had to go through to do that, the chemicals involved are illegal today. Oh, so uh, okay. It, they're I, really priceless in many ways, I think. Okay. Well, that, that's interesting. I did not know that. Now, speaking of that, uh, what's, what's the eventual goal for these... Uh, the, the gold plated they, they have well, a home kind of way the, uh, there uh, so many of the models in the, this uh, display here are are very low production models and uh, the um, uh, the National Model Railroad Association is is working with the uh, California State Railway Museum in, in Sacramento to put up a display. Uh, of model trains in that museum. And uh, I have told uh, uh, Charlie Getz at the NMRA that uh, uh, I will contribute any of these models to the NMRA that they want and uh, for that uh, display. And I think all, all nine of the gold-plated HO models will, will go to Sacramento. Well, first of all, that's very kind of you. Second of all, I think it's a great spot for them because everybody will be able to appreciate them. Mm -hmm. And third, I think it's interesting because it kind of helps cement the importance of brass in the mm -hmm. model railroading industry and that early era there of the hand built with the mm -hmm. Japanese. So, well, it really that the uh, Tenshoto, which uh, uh, turned out to be uh, the builder of really the best of the. Japanese models uh, was started in 1949, mm -hmm. so just uh, essentially about three years after the war was over. And uh, Bill Ryan came along in 1954, 53 or 54, and, and began importing, I think his first model imported was 1954 and then 55. And it, uh, the, um, uh, the really active part of the import business went up through about 1975. And then uh, prices kept going up and up and up and the costs going up. And, and then, of course, the Koreans came along and began to make cheaper models and, and uh, uh, provide some competition to the Japanese. So that, but, uh, but the uh, really wonderful hand-built gold-plated kinds of of models uh, uh, 
that was pretty well over by 70, 1975. Yeah, I think we're fortunate they're even all preserved in one collection. It would have been so easy for them to scatter with the wind and it, it, it never would, be able to piece it, it, it together You'd again. never be able to get them back together again. And, uh, and thank God uh, uh, Bill Ryan sold them all at once, and, and, and the fellow that bought them uh, didn't know enough about it to not sell them again all at once. <laughs> <laughs> and one other, before we move on, one other interesting tidbit you just shared with me is, and it's logical when you think about it, but those are basically nine different builders, right, that built That's those. That's right, yes. The, the gold-plated models did not all come from the same builder. Right. They came from nine different builders, and it came over a period of, a, of about uh, 12 or 15 years. Yeah. Yeah. So now... Obviously, you were fortunate enough to acquire that collection. How did you go about piecing together the rest of your collection? Because it's really quite an impressive array of these early hand-built models. Well, you know, I, I don't know. I um, uh, Living in California, I always was a great fan of the uh, uh, the cab-forward articulated that were uh, went, ran over the Sierras and uh, the... Uh, uh, it's interesting that uh, they that Southern Pacific was the only one that really uh, used the cab forward design. Uh, fortunately, it, it was they were oil burners, and so it was easy to turn the engine around, and run it the the other, uh, run it in reverse. It's just uh, a steam engine is just as efficient in reverse as it is uh, going forward, and um, but. Uh, uh, and for a long time, they called those engines widowmakers because the, the uh, engineer and fireman were right out in front of the in the front of the engine, and if it hit anything, they were the first to go. Um, but um, at any rate, uh, uh, I admired the cab forwards, and and I guess it was PFM uh, was one of the first ones to import a model of a cab forward, and that got me started and. And once you get started, uh, it's uh, uh, it's an infectious uh, kind of uh, activity. That it, uh, it's fun to to uh, collect things that there are so few of. Yeah, and so really for you, your love of trains merged with your love of the artisans and the craftsmanship of these models. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, and um, so it's. Uh, no, I think the, the the way they're put together, and it, uh, it's remarkable the the detail uh, in them, and the, the uh, and the um, the fact is that the scales worked very well, and you know they are not uh, they're not distorted. No, in fact, that's that's kind of like a myth we've tried to disprove: is they're not crude, especially no. even very quickly. I mean, there's full in cab detail. They're very straight and built so well. They may be a little more simplistic in their detail than some of the late Korean models, but they're they're really not crude at all. They're really beautiful. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. Yeah. Now, I have to ask you, like, you've had this set up for many years, and occasionally a guy like me comes across and starts drooling, right? <laughs> <laughs> but what about some of the average people that come through? I mean, do you find they're interested in these models? Or? Oh, well, they're... You know, I find a lot of people uh, used to have an interest in, in model trains, you know, and uh, so, no, I get uh, a number of visitors through here occasionally that, uh, uh, and I just, uh, the other night, talked to one of my neighbors, and I had no idea that he had an interest in trains, but, but he evidently was an enthusiast. You know, it's, uh, uh, interest in model trains is really sort of a funny kind of a, of a hobby. You can have two people in the same office working on the same floor of the same building for years and years and years without the, the, either one of them knowing the other one is interested in model trains. It's sort of a closet hobby in a way. Yeah, that's <laughs> funny. But then when people do finally meet up, it's interesting. It kind of like uh, levels the playing field. We had another we visited with a couple of guys uh, earlier on this trip. And, you know, they're... Um, background is very different. You know, one of the fellows is extremely wealthy. Some of them maybe not as much, but they all get together and 
just love oh, trains, yes. and yeah. it's yeah. kind of a common bond. It is a common bond, and it, it uh, and uh, the differences in wealth uh, disappear when you, right. when you get together. <laughs> There's no question about it, and it's uh, it's fun for me. There's a, a great uh, model railroad club down in uh, in San Jose, and I've been down there and seen some some of the work that they're doing. They're building a great uh, layout, and uh, and some guys are. Uh, just spend all of their time working on buildings and and, uh, and scenery and things like that, and they get a big kick out of that. They, you don't have to you don't have to go for the brass brass engines in order to enjoy the hobby. No, and a lot of times that's not where it starts, is it? It no. kind of works its yeah. way up there. Yeah. yeah, it does. Yeah, and that's what we of course focus on a little bit, but we we love all sorts of model railroading. Well, I've I've concentrated on the, the articulated locomotives to a, a great extent. Uh, emphasis on Southern Pacific and Union Pacific, less emphasis on Santa Fe, and I don't know why, but partly because Santa Fe was more important down in uh, in Southern California than it was up here, and uh, of course we had the daylight engines running back and forth up and down the. Pacific Coast, so the Southern Pacific and the Daylight en- Engines was uh, one of my early interests here. And uh, um, anyway, it's been uh, it's been a lot of fun. Well, I'm sure you enjoyed the first part of our interview with Mr. Reed Dennis, and the second part will be airing in a future episode. Now, Reed was generous enough to make available several models from his prolific collection. And several of those will be showing up on our website in coming weeks. Just to give you a little preview, I have here some of the samplings. Uh, Some of the models he has, of course, are the early hand belts that we talked about, but also some very rare and unique pieces from Fujiami, some uh, Tenshoto pieces that are very special. Uh, For example, there's a there's a, a 4664 for Rio Grande, which was a back shop special. I believe there was only uh, 35 of those done in 1973, and also some very late run rare Tenshoto models. Now, what else is really unique about some of the pieces that uh, Reed is putting on the market are they are just exceptionally rare and unbelievably detailed. Uh, some of these models, uh, we believe, and we're going to continue to do future research, but were actually built by Tenshoto and have some amazing detail in the back head and some of the built up quality is like nothing you've ever seen. We have pieces from originally the Bill Ryan collection, also pieces from the John Lawn collection. This is an example uh, of a piece from the John, Col- John Lawn collection, which just amazes me because as we take a look inside of it, some of the super detailing done, and this is a Chesapeake and Ohio 2662, some of the super detailing done in the back head and along uh, the boiler and uh, even on the tender is just superb. Uh, Some of the, even the hoses pairing up between the tender and the locomotive on on some of these pieces is spectacular. Now, another piece we have is an example of something very unique, this Chesapeake and Ohio J3. Uh, This is special because uh, it had some super detailing done, and then it was also painted by Jerry Spolma. We have a nice selection of the Gem Rubies, including a Gem Ruby Big Boy, unpainted, that will be coming up. We're going to talk about more uh, of these pieces in depth in future episodes, but we wanted to give you a little preview of what's coming your way. Now we're going to kick it over to Roland, and he's going to get you up to date on our project updates. Hey, thanks, Dan. The two that we wanted to mention to you this week are items that are going to be delivered to us very soon. The first one comes from PSC. It's the O-Scale Chesapeake and Ohio H7 2882s. Now, we do have a few reservations left for these. We ordered a couple of extras, but uh, we've seen photos of these, and these models do look spectacular. So we expect them in our door any day now, Mark over Precision tells us. So go ahead and get your reservations in. Otherwise, we're going to have them up for sale on our site. Uh, These really, really look good. Uh, The second uh, project that we're looking at is the Great Northern 01 project from North Bank Line. Now, we've gotten several inquiries from you, our customers, on these. We do have a lot of reservations, which is great. And we know the project's taken a little bit longer than expected, 
Believe me, with the big boys, we know what that's all about. Uh, but we're told that they're going to be here in the month of October. So we're seeing some images right now across the screen. These are in Korea. Burim is uh, assembling these right now. So we do expect those to be coming into our doors uh, shortly. Uh, we think they're going to be well worth the wait on those. Now, going into our next segment, which is our how-tos. As we mentioned at the outset, we're going to be talking with Mr. Boyd Reyes out in California. And this particular segment in our how-tos is about uh, stripping and painting a brass model train. Now, we realize that many of you might be familiar with these uh, first few steps uh, that are going to take place. We're going to start off with safety aspects. That's going to be segment one today. We have 15 different segments that we're going to cover throughout this process. So over the season here, season two, we're going to uh, bring these to you one at a time or, or sometimes two uh, on a segment or on a show rather. And you're going to see these uh, over, this, over the course of this year. So feel free to look back at previous episodes. Uh, you can look at these different segments as we tie uh, all of them together. But we really feel that starting off with safety is something that's very important when it comes to uh, stripping and painting a brass model train. So let's go ahead and take a look at that clip that we had taped earlier while we were out in California. We're out here in Fullerton, California, and here with one of my favorite friends, Mr. Boyd Reyes. Boyd, thanks, thanks for having us into your home. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, on such a, a nice, yeah. nice sunny day here in California. Now, we wanted to talk with you just a little bit, uh, first of all, about painting, and then we're going to get into to some of the aspects here of safety. Now, tell us again, how long have you been painting? For around 30 years. 30 years. Yeah. So you've got a lot of experience uh, under your belt, so to speak. Yeah, back in, yeah, it's it's been a while. Okay. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, I just know that the early, earlier days, you know, just safety wasn't stressed. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, back then we washed our hands in the paint thinner and you know, just dealing with some of these chemicals. Now we want to live longer, so that's why. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we didn't wear seatbelts a long time <laughs> yeah, ago either. I know. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, all right. So, uh, yeah, definitely we're going to talk about uh, a, a safety uh, here in just a bit. But, uh, you know, I just wanted to let you know that uh, for the Monday Morning Express show, at the end of season one, uh, we sent out a survey to all of our customers. And did you know what was the number one thing that came back that people wanted to see? Painting. Guess why we're here. <laughs> yeah, painting. <laughs> painting. Yeah, painting, how-to, repairs. And so uh, what we're going to do is, uh, here with Boyd, and you're so kind to be able to, to show us this, uh, one of a few painters that we're actually going to have on the show, but uh, we're going to go through the different uh, processes and steps uh, that you take in preparing and painting a brass model train. And so we're going to present this in a few uh, different uh, segments here. So today we're going to start with uh, the safety aspect, of course, and then we'll get into some of the other steps that uh, go into uh, even removing uh, paint from a train, uh, yes. you know, stripping it bare, uh, down to painting it, decaling it, uh, everything that's involved with it. And we're certainly going to uh, see how that process goes. And for me, I personally, I, this is one of those aspects that I absolutely love, uh, wow. is to be uh, able to see this uh, this process from different individuals such as yourself. Yeah, it's a lost art. I mean, it's disappearing, and mm -hmm. I'd like to bring it back. So anything I can do to show you guys, let, let's get everybody painting again. You yeah, know? just get all this old inventory. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Well, as we mentioned, you know, one of the very uh, first things to begin with is the aspect of safety. Because yes. too many times uh, we want to just jump into a project and we're not maybe thinking safety first, but, you know, with the particular paints and the various chemicals uh, that we use, not only can it be a fire hazard, right, uh, but also for our lungs. And so tell us a little bit about uh, what you use. We have some of these uh, on our table here and why they're so necessary. Well, I, gloves. Gloves are a very major important thing. I mean, just you just don't want paint to be all over your hands. I Gloves are fairly cheap. Mm -hmm. I get them from, as these gloves, I get them from Harbor Freight. Uh, Home Depot, those major um, stores have them. Sure. But there's different si sizes and different styles of gloves and di different thicknesses. And there's ones that are rated for chemicals as the black ones right okay. over here. And they, these are light duty ones. The light duty is when I spray. Sure. I'm really not aiming the paint 
or the gun at my hand. So just in case, just in case if you get something on your finger, but where the black ones, the thicker, the mi nine millimeter for the harsher chemicals. So we, example, when you're stripping or something. Stripping, yes. Right, because I believe cleaning you, or right, yeah, you right. just use those. Okay. Versus these are a, a lot thinner and they're a lot easier to, to spray with. You know, they, your comfort um, level on the, the lightweight ones are, are good for yeah. spraying. The problem is if you use thick ones and you're spraying, your, your finger for the airbrush, Sure. if you don't have the right size, you have the touch, it's right? gonna hurt after a yeah. while. Yeah, you'll feel cramping and stuff. So I make sure that the gloves properly fit that there's no wrinkles on them because the problem is that your gloves are oversized or wrong. Uh, if they're undersized, they can rip on you. It's just better make sure you have the right size. Right, and, and I right. and I see that these are uh, powder free. They actually say in there because you know some of the times the the gloves that you could pick up at a Home Depot or Harbor Freight, uh, you can have that powder on the glove itself. And the problem with that, as you know, you might guess, <laughs> is that would transfer to the train. Yes. So whenever, especially when you're spraying and you don't want powder uh, in your in your paint. Yeah, or there's uh, latex. A lot of people are allergic to latex, yes. and so, oh yeah, I don't have that problem. But I've used some of the other plastic gloves, yeah. and yeah, I'm just not a big fan. Maybe uh, with if they want to put on the plastic ones underneath and then slip on the right. That's a good idea. Yeah, that's a good idea because yeah. then the you latex know? wouldn't be against the skin like that. Correct. Yeah. So okay. Some well, that's some, that's some really good it. tips. Yeah. Really good tips. All right. What do we have here? A mask. These I, you can get them at Home Depot or Harbor Freight. I really recommend wearing a mask, not the 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 surgical ones, the paper ones. Those are yeah. You're gonna need it filtered. Yeah. where you can change out your filters. Be sure that after you use your mask, that you put it back inside the bag and seal, seal it, it up. up. That way, because there are, there are char there's charcoal canisters in here and they're always active. So you gotta make sure that if you, most people don't paint every day, they paint every so often. So to make sure that your mask is gonna work right, uh, just clean the inside, put it back, store it until the next time you paint. Okay. But, and show uh, us how to take a cartridge off. It's real yeah, simple. These, these, these pop out right here. Yeah. Now that's going to be hard, but these, oh, no way. These are Do they the non turn off? Let's see. These Maybe are not, not. It's not like the 3M okay. ones. The 3M okay. ones, you can pop this off. Yeah, this is a, a cheaper version, but uh, yeah, these, you can take it off take it and up, then put on a new filter. Okay. okay. But yeah, I think this is just, but the well, point is, here's is one the, filter right yeah. here. You can see the the the. It's yeah. already has some absolutely stuff some on there. Okay. Yeah. So the point is though that you can change these out. You don't have to throw away the entire mask. So yeah. the cartridges, no matter what uh, uh, mask that you purchase, a higher end one or even one like this right here, you can change those out, and that's important too to make sure that you're filtering clean air. Oh yeah, right? yeah. It definitely it, with all your mask, I would change these periodically. You know. Uh, I, since I spray every day, I try to get new filters on every week. Okay. You know? And then um, as for the mask, I try to change out a mask like probably like every other month right. because of the right. canisters and right. stuff like that. So that's why I go through masks all the time. Okay. But it's, I'd rather go through a mask because you only have two pairs of, just one pair yeah, of lungs, one pair of lungs, you know, lungs right? yeah, that's it, you know. So. And we know individuals who have actually died because of exposure to that, of yes. paints, and uh, any who are familiar with that, they know they, they'd be very toxic uh, uh, on us here. Oh, yeah. So yeah. very important, our safety equipment. And of course, uh, we don't show it right here, but the, the fire extinguisher is, is very important too uh, because of chemicals that you can deal with. So make sure to have uh, that on hand too anytime that you're you're spraying in, in yeah. your home and your facility. Some kind of water source too. I mean, right. um, I wish I had an eye wash station. That, yeah. Those are very important. In most uh, businesses, you all have an yeah. eye wash station. We have one in our shop. It, it yeah. is, and they're generally not that expensive. So oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, you can get them hanging right on a wall, which works good. You could get them that uh, actually hook right up to your water line. Uh, oh. So there's a few different types available. Yeah. So 
Those are just some of the safety features, not all of them by any means, but uh, just some of the ones we just wanted to make sure to highlight uh, before we get into the actual uh, stripping or, or painting or using chemicals uh, in this process. So anything else on that? Uh, I, we're an apron, you know? Oh, an apron, talking about idea. safety, you know? You get your brand new shirt full of paint, your wife will kill you. So you're you know? telling so, me we're yeah. gonna get dirty today. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I wore a... a, a several aprons and stuff to make sure that, you know, it only takes that one little, I, yeah. sometimes I think, I'm just gonna go spray. Just gotta sure. go touch up. Shake that bottle. Oh no, you know, so yeah, I just make sure that I have an apron on. Okay, and one other point, both of us are wearing eyeglasses, yes. and I know yours just like mine, it yeah. serves as a protection. If you don't have eyeglasses on, that's another added uh, feature of protection yes. that you might wanna consider. Sometimes even a full shield, a shield would work out great, you know, for using, for stripping, stripping yeah. models and stuff. And we're gonna see um, that in our next segment. Oh, yeah. So we'll get into some of that. You'll see uh, Boyd here using uh, all of that equipment. So we look forward to bringing that to you in part two. That's pretty cool stuff there from Boyd. So as we mentioned, uh, it was about safety, but safety is very, very important when it comes to uh, stripping and painting a brass model train. Now in our second segment, which comes up next week, we're gonna go ahead and strip that model train. So you're gonna see why the safety was so important. So we look forward to that on our next segment. But now, we're gonna send it over to Dan for mail time. Well today we're gonna to wrap up our mail bag and our From the Archive sections into one. Starts with a nice email I got from a fellow named Don Kirick. Uh, here's what Don had to say. Wow, wow, wow. Congrats on the start of season two, Monday Morning Express. Yourself, Roland, and the team are just killing it. You raised an already high bar and hit the ground running. Please keep it coming. My father and I could not wait for season two to get rolling. I am very aware with my profession what it takes to produce such a high level segment to air once a week. So hats off to you and the entire team at BrassTrains.com along with your guest on the show. Now, Don went on to say some uh, very kind things, but he also stated this. He says, I am, send I am also sending this quick email to introduce myself as a lifelong model railroader with my father, brass collector and user, yes, we love to see them run, and a 35-year professional commercial photographer. And within the last year, I have entered the model manufacturing world and launched a line of HO scale craftsman kits and details. Please see the attached catalog. It's been very rewarding, not the easiest creative process I've ever jumped into, but the results far outweigh the learning curve. Well, you've been seeing on your screen some pictures of Don's beautiful kits. I was super impressed uh, with his design and the overall feel to get that type of structure to look that good. Uh, Don is obviously an artist. Uh, apparently it was uh, last week's episode seeing all those craftsman kits built up and kits uh, that I got to build through the years that inspired Don to send in this message. So we're going to put uh, on our screen a link to Don's website. If like myself you had not yet seen his kits, uh, I think they're available for pre-order and some of those details might be available now. So check them out. Uh, it's not a paid sponsor. <laughs> I just was really enthralled to see that. You know, that kind of leads us into our From the Archives. Many do not realize this, but early in our company's history, we had a line of craftsman kits out. And you might wonder, well, what were those? Well, they were called the Frenchie Gratz Collection. So why would they be called the Frenchie Gratz Collection? Well, we had run into an architect uh, named Frenchie Gratz, uh, myself and my father, and we were really impressed with some of the uh, structures that he had. We bought several, and you know, at the time we thought it'd be a great idea to get into producing craftsman kits. It wasn't a great idea, but it seemed like one. So myself and my father, we put together uh, these manuals. I wrote like little stories in here. Uh, they're, they're pretty cheesy. It's full of uh, pretty bad puns. And uh, there's even some cartoons here drawn by my cousin. This one says, it says, using his first wish to instantly acquire the entire Frenchie Gratz collection, Leroy suddenly finds his life ultimately fulfilled and decides to forfeit his two remaining wishes. So cheesy stories, bad puns, corny jokes. 
Needless to say, I'm very proud of our work here. <laughs> and we had to laser cut all these parts and bag them by hand. And uh, wow, my hat's off to guys who do this more often. So if you've ever seen a Frenchy Gratz kits before, and later I think we sold them back to Frenchy and he turned the name into Built Right Models. Uh, you know, a little more of the history behind us. And while I'm talking about uh, building kits, I just wanted to take the last few moments of the show to give a shout out to my good friend, uh, Jim Sacco. Jim underwent some nasty cancer, uh, several operations this past summer, and uh, he's pulled through, but you're probably more familiar with him as City Classics. Now, his buildings uh, grace some of the best layouts in the universe, Rod Stewart, George Celios, you're gonna see kit bashed uh, City Classics buildings on those layouts, so buy a bunch of them, kit bash them, they work great for that. I've done it and plan to continue to do it. We're gonna show his uh, website as well, follow that link. Uh, even if you're not into buying the structures, he sells some really nice signs, uh, some backlit interiors, which is a clever idea. Um, and even he has these neat little like jigs, these little corner braces that work great if you're putting together an acrylic or resin structure. So please check out his website. Um, if you can buy direct, that does him and his wife, Cindy, the most good. But wherever you buy his product, I'm sure he'll appreciate it. He's been around the hobby a long time. He has an absolutely fantastic reputation amongst his peers. So I've always felt like craftsman kits and brass trains go hand in hand because it's the best of the buildings and the best model trains. And boy, when you put them together, it's hard to tell from real life. Thank you so much for joining us this week on Monday Morning Express, and we can't wait to see you back next week with even more exciting things in store.